Hi, thanks for tuning in to the Generative Work Podcast with me, Sarah James Wright, exploring all aspects of future business and conscious leadership. So today we're going to be talking about presencing or connecting, really the art and practice of being. And this is the answer for me to the question, where do we start in any kind of generative journey? Really, we start by stopping. So we're going to be looking at the power of pause and how we can really connect to the wider life force to bring our projects and our leadership and our best selves forward. This is one of the key capacities of generative leaders, presencing or connecting. And it's part of the flow of connection that we talk about in generative work. And whether we're working with an individual or collective, most of the time, the systems that we're working with, when we come into contact with them, they're kind of at breaking point. They're working beyond their natural capacity. And if it's an individual leader, often you notice that in terms of their health. They're tired, they're stressed, they're overwhelmed, they're doing too much. And with a team, there's often a culture of overwork. They're trying to do more than they can actually comfortably do. So when they come to us and say, well, I'd like to change X, then the first thing we must do is build enough capacity into the system for there to be any kind of change process happen. Um, it's worth mentioning, I don't even really like the word change, but we can come back to that another time. But when you start, any notion of learning and discovery about what does becoming generative mean, or I want to do this in a particular way, I want to work more generatively, if, if you're already beyond your natural capacity, how can you really learn and grow and change? There's no space to discover anything new. And in fact, in that state, if you come and bring an idea, it just actually feels like you're pushing more expectation onto an overworked system. And really, you can't give from a place of lack The first thing you need to do is to find a little bit of time and space to embrace the new. You just need to stop. Time and space is something that we're going to come back to again and again. They're part of the really key principles of living and working generatively. And when I was a kid, I had one of those games where it's like a little square with um, tiles that you move around and it makes a picture or a word or something. And there's always one tile missing so that you can juggle the, the letters or the picture around and make the whole. And I think systems are like that too. If all of the tiles were filled in in the game, nothing would be able to move around and I wouldn't be able to discover the picture inside. Systems are the same. Unless there's some space within you as a leader or within your team, how can you really expect yourselves to go on a journey of discovery to find out what working generatively means? So we create some capacity to explore. And it's also true that working in this way is very different from working with the old mindset It's really about discovering joy and kind of natural movements and flows. It's not about efforting. It's it's not a chore. It's not work in that sense. It's work in the sense of our life's work. It's, It's a joyful, enjoyable thing to do. And this sounds simple just to stop and make some space to bring the new in. But actually, it's often one of the hardest things for people to do. Most of us lead lives that are completely overstuffed with obligation and responsibility and expectation. And we've lived in that way for so long. We're a little bit addicted to the struggle and the busyness, and it can be really hard to stop. 
So one thing is to acknowledge how difficult it is to do that. So I'd say don't underestimate it. It's something I'm still working on, you know, almost on a daily basis, really about learning to do less. But the first thing we need to do is to stop acting crazy and begin to notice the space around us. When we carve out some time and space, we can just stop. And there's nothing to do. It's in that space, it's not a doing activity. It really is around non doing, it's around being. And when we begin to do that, we start to see ourselves within the context in which we operate, whether it's our family, our home life, our relationships with friends, loved ones, whether it's the work environment or the wider world we start to see ourselves as part of that bigger picture. We begin to look at ourselves from the outside in, as opposed to just being so caught up with whatever task we're engaged in at the time. And when we expand the frame of our lives in this way and begin to see ourselves as something larger, we begin to connect to the deeper life force itself. And you may wonder, well, you know, what is that? And really, I'd say about that, well, what is it to you? You know, I don't think it matters how you experience or define that. You might have a spiritual understanding of it or a scientific understanding of it or just an everyday experience of it. It really doesn't matter. But there is always something larger than us around us. And if we slow down, and practice being instead of doing, we begin to have an awareness of that. We begin to see life itself at work. And nature is great for this. It gives us an idea of how life is just doing its thing without us there, without us having a plan or making an effort or keeping on task or any of the other which ways that we put pressure on ourselves. Nature just happens. The life force is there flowing through every plant, every tree, every herb, whatever you see when you go outside. Kids are great for this as well. I mean, kids just grow. You don't need to do anything for children to grow and develop. They do that for themselves naturally. That's the way of being for children. And pets is another one. You know, if you've got a cat or a dog or, you know, any kind of animal that you're around, you'll see them engaging with the life force in a really different way. When is it time to eat? When is it time to sleep? So anything that still lives in a natural flow state is a really good lesson when we're beginning to find that for ourselves. Pot plants are a great one. You can't force a pot plant to grow any quicker than it's growing. And it also has its season. There's a time for growing and a time for staying still. So if we can begin, uh, begin to stop, start stopping so that you can start living generatively, you can notice how it is. This idea of working with what is, is another really key principle of working generatively. We can't discover movement from the past or the future. We have to be in the present moment. It's the only place in life where we have any power to alter how things are. So if we begin to be with the present moment and notice what is, we're beginning to see life as it is without judgment or expectation. We begin to recognise that we are a part of that wider whole. We're not separate from it. We're not struggling along and life is there outside, maybe for our downtime and our relaxation. We are always part of the wider systems of life. And from this place of just not doing and noticing and being with whatever's there, a longing will naturally kind of arise. You know, from here, we'll begin to discover what our heart's longing is, what our purpose is. We'll begin to hear a calling in time as to the right path for us. But even saying that is tricky because 
you know, quite often people get caught up around their purpose and feel that they have to discover that now, immediately. And they worry about what that is. And will they notice it? Will they discover it right? Um, how will it relate to everything else that they've done in their lives? Nothing makes sense to them. So I think it's better to think about just doing nothing. Just discover a place of nothing. And anything that you're meant to do in life will arise from that space of being. And it's good to develop practices that can help you to make an everyday connection with the life force around you. And again, I never, I never give a kind of prescriptive of what that could be, because that could be anything. And any of us have had those moments where it just feels as if time stands still and we are actually in a moment of perfect being in our lives. And that can sometimes be like doing the washing up or going for a, work, a walk or seeing our kids playing, just noticing a happy day, dancing, whatever it might be. And of course, there's all kinds of formal practices around yoga and meditation and, um, you know, my own practice is chanting. And these things are great to keep you connected on an everyday level but I don't think they're essential. I think any way you you discover that helps you to feel connected is right for you. And I would say a really simple and really effective one is just getting outside into nature. It's partly, I think, being out under the sky so that we physically notice a bigger framing for life. And then we're more conscious of environmental flows from the weather and the kind of natural processes around us. And as I said, we can see examples of nature and how much that demonstrates to us how things really work in a natural and generative way. But I'd say anything that you find that works for you is your way of connecting. There's not one way better than another. And it's helpful to find how often do you need to connect? You may develop an everyday practice, something that you want to do every morning, every evening, twice a day, whatever works for you. But if that's really difficult, if you're someone that's super busy at the moment, it might be that you just decide once a week or even once a month, you have a date with yourself and take yourself off for a couple of hours. Any time that you give, it's really an investment in this sense of presencing and connecting to this force that's larger than you. And this is a really important way of making the shift from ego to eco sensibility. And that's, uh, it, that language is specifically used in Theory U, which if you've never heard of before, you will hear a lot more about it on these podcasts. Um, it's a, a system of change management that arose out of MIT. In fact, they have a book called Presencing that I would recommend. And they did uh, an extended study on really capable leaders and one of the things they found was their ability to stay ahead of the curve and to adapt their business to changing environments. And they discovered that all the leaders that could do that, that could pivot quickly and keep their business flowing, all had some kind of presencing practice. So whatever that is, whatever way you choose to connect, it doesn't matter. But this practice of checking in, and acknowledging that you're part of something larger is a really essential first step to working generatively. As you do that, you begin to trust in that life force. And the space that you get can actually produce really incredible results, particularly around clarity and decision making. If you're someone that struggles with that, you can find it's really helpful just to have a bit of prescribed downtime. And it doesn't mean sitting on your phone, watching TV, possibly reading a book, but I'd, I'd really advocate for actual nothing doing. 
You know, find yourself a way of just lying on your bed, even if it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, just explore having space. And a client of mine worked with this. We'd been working together for quite a long while, but she was still having problems around decision making. And if ever there was a decision that she needed to take, it felt as if the the volume of possibilities would overwhelm her and she would get caught up in trying to decide the right thing. And it was a pattern that had been with her for a long time, this idea that we've got to get it right. Many of us are working with that pattern. So we really struggle with the fear of getting things wrong and making the right decision. And so after some time, we really managed to include this practice once a week for her to just take a morning or as much of a morning as she could. She was also a single mum of a young child, so she had a lot to contend with to find the time and space. But to sit in a little bit of meditation, whatever felt right to her that day, but just to sit and allow herself the space of not thinking, not deciding, not doing anything. And it was kind of no surprise to me, but a great surprise to her, that after a few weeks of doing this, things really began to move and flow in her life, particularly around decision making. And in fact, we we began seeing each other less in the coaching relationship because she was able to handle more of her own life and her own choices just as a result of putting space in. Just that simple thing had a really tangible effect on how she was. There's another aspect of this that is very relevant to working generatively and it really speaks to the ego to eco shift. When we see ourselves as the centre of our universe and everything that we are doing requires our effort, we're making ourselves responsible for everything that happens in our lives. And the truth is, we're not. The truth is, life does most of the work for us. You know, we're breathing in and breathing out, the body is functioning, life just happens And we've ended up, particularly in the modern Western society, but pretty much now globally, in this habit of feeling that we have to control everything, including nature, including life itself. I think it comes really from, in the Victorian era, and well, really the age of enlightenment, and the kind of prioritization of reason as at that time religion was waning. People no longer trusted in God and they were beginning to trust in science and feeling as if nature was something within man's control. And I use the word man uh, deliberately in this context because it was very much about men doing this at that time. So this idea that human beings have dominion over the natural world has resulted in the horrendous situation we can see in the ecosystem at the moment and the amount of pollution and the overuse of resources in our planet. But I think in small ways, all of us are still operating under that notion day to day, that we are in control of our lives and everything we do is by the force of our own will. The reality is that life flows and we are a part of that flow and sometimes we can flow with it and sometimes we can fight against it. And that seems to me when we're really efforting, when we're trying too hard, when we feel like we're stuck, when we feel like we're trying to change and not getting anywhere, that is a clue that we've gone back into our small self, our ego. And the notion of the ego is really that which separates us from the whole, that which individuates us from the whole of being. So the move towards an ecosystem way of being allows us to be a part of that whole as it flows, as it grows, as it goes on its way, we can just go with it. And then we can begin to notice that there is always some kind of movement towards change present 
That's the nature of life. We don't need to do anything for us to see that. We see that in our pot plants and our children and our pets. We see that when we're out walking in nature. The nature of life is to grow and change. And that's in us. That life force is in us too. We're always growing and learning and developing. So we can begin to be conscious about that without needing to make it another chore. So there's a way of looking at this, which is to say that we kind of find the movement or allow the movement to find us and allow life to change us rather than feeling as if we are the ones that have to go out there and make a change in life. And that's at the heart of working generatively, that we trust that there is an intelligent design to life, that there's an intelligent design within our work systems And they themselves are always learning and growing and developing. And if we can really begin to tune in to the wider world around us, we can find those places that are already flowing. So we can swim downstream rather than trying to swim upstream. And the first step in doing that is really to practice being in whatever way works for you. So in terms of taking my own advice, how do I do this? Well, I've definitely been or am one of those people that tries to schedule every minute, fill every day, feeling like I'm constantly needing to push and do more in one or other or generally multiple areas of my life at once. And it's taken me 30 odd years of spiritual inquiry to begin to learn to slow down and practice being. Now I can. Now I can definitely do it. And I do have a daily practice and take some deeper time at certain points through the year or whenever I need it to really kind of come back into relationship with my being. But we can so easily get caught up in the busyness of the day again. So I now, my daily schedule includes a lot of time and space just to be. And that's quite hard to do at the beginning. And it's still quite hard for me sometimes to fit in. I look at the amount of hours I'm working in a day and sometimes it doesn't feel enough because I've fitted in a walk in the woods and some yoga and some meditation and so on. But it absolutely makes a difference to how I feel. So I can get completely knotted up with work in the course of a morning and feel stressed and as if my head's going to explode. And if I go for a walk at lunchtime, all of that just melts away. My energy levels come back up. Generally on the way up, it's good for me because I live near a hill. So my walk is generally uphill on the way out and then downhill on the way back, which is just right for me. So I can make some more physical effort as I stomp up the hill and get rid of any stress I've acquired during the morning. And then there's a moment where I can kind of, I get to a great view at the top and I gain my perspective on life again. And then on the way down, naturally, the afternoon's work starts to kind of draw me towards it. And I begin to have ideas about what I might want to do or just the creative flow starts to kind of arrive in me without me trying to do anything. So by the time I come down the hill and I'm ready for my afternoon, my energy levels are reset. My head feels clear and I'm ready for the afternoon. And my own practice, my daily practice is chanting. I have a Buddhist practice and so I chant generally twice a day but I don't beat myself up if I don't manage it twice a day. And there's odd little everyday things that really work for me. Like I love filling the dishwasher. I hate it when the rest of the family do it because they never do it in the way that I like it. (laughs) Not much of a control freak. But what I love about it is that it's my jigsaw puzzle. And I like to fit in as much as possible. I like to get the plates just right so I know they're going to be washed from underneath and be really clean. And so in the morning when I come down and unpack the dishwasher, I can really enjoy that morning ritual. And I like to do it as quietly as possible. So I can mindfully unpack the dishwasher and later in the day, mindfully pack 
the dishwasher. And that in that moment, I'm just bringing my full focus and attention to the task at hand. I'm really present to that task, even one as humdrum as emptying or refilling the dishwasher. And that's a lot of what presencing is about. Just coming into the present moment, whatever it is. And the other aspect of it is noticing how you feel in that moment. Because our moods, our state of life goes up and down and round and round all day long. And if you can just bring your attention back to the present moment, it's like a reset button. You can notice how you feel. You can notice how your body is. You can notice what's going on, what's moving around you, and then begin to reconnect to that wider space of life. Becoming present really is the first step to working generatively. And every time we kind of fall off the bandwagon of working generatively, it's the first place we come to to reset ourselves and begin from that expanded, connected place. So it's really worth investing in doing less, unlearning, efforting and making time to do absolutely nothing at all. So thank you for joining us for this episode of the Generative Work podcast. And what did you think? If you have any questions or comments, it would be great to get your feedback. And if you would like to come on and ask me three questions about generative work, we'd love to hear from you. There are links in the bottom of the description for the email and website where you can get in touch. We're looking to build a truly collaborative community for people interested in working generatively, so all ideas welcome. And we look forward to exploring another topic with you next time. Drop us an email if you'd like an update on our next podcast release.